Letter twenty of Clarissa, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ben Dutton, Lampeter, Wales. Clarissa Harlowe, or the History of a Young Lady, Volume One by Samuel Richardson. Letter twenty. Miss Clarissa Harlowe to Miss Howe, Saturday afternoon. The expected conference is over, but my difficulties are increased. This, as my mother was pleased to tell me, being the last persuasory effort that is to be attempted, I will be particular in the account of it as my head, and my heart will allow it to be. I have made, said she, as she entered my room, a short as well as an early dinner, on purpose to confer with you, and I do assure you that it will be the last conference I shall either be permitted or inclined to hold with you on the subject. If you should prove as refractory as it is imagined, you will prove by some, who are of opinion, that I have not the weight with you which my indulgence deserves. But I hope you will convince them as well them as me of the contrary. Your father both dines and sups at your uncle's, on purpose to give us this opportunity, and, according to the report I shall make on his return, which I have promised shall be a very faithful one, he will take his measures with you. I was offering to speak. Here, Clarissa, what I have to tell you, said she, before you speak, unless what you have to say will signify to me your compliance. Say, will it? If it will, you may speak. I was silent. She looked with concern and anger upon me. No compliance, I find. Such a dutiful young creature hitherto. Will you not... Can you not speak as I would have you speak? Then, rejecting me as it were with her hand, continue silent. I no more than your father will bear your avowed contradiction. She paused, with a look of expectation, as if she waited for my consenting answer. I was still silent, looking down the tears in my eyes. O oh, thou determined girl! But say, speak out. Are you resolved to stand in opposition to us all, in a point our hearts are set upon? May I, madame, be permitted to expostulate? To what purpose expostulate with me, Clarissa? Your father is determined. Have I not told you there is no receding? that the honour as well as the interest of the family is concerned? Be ingenuous. You used to be so, even occasionally against yourself. Who at the long run must submit? All of us to you, or you to all of us? If you intend to yield at last, if you find you cannot conquer, yield now, and with a grace, for yield you must, or be none of our child. I wept. I knew not what to say, or rather how to express what I had to say. Take notice that there are flaws in your grandfather's will. Not a shilling of that estate will be yours, if you do not yield. Your grandfather left it to you as a reward of your duty to him and to us. You will justly forfeit it if— Permit me, good madame, to say that— if it were unjustly bequeathed me, I ought not to wish to have it. But I hope Mr. Soames will be apprised of these flaws. This is very pertly said, Clarissa. But reflect that the forfeiture of that estate, through your opposition, will be attended with the total loss of your father's favour. And then how destitute must you be, how unable to support yourself— and how many benevolent designs and good actions must you give up? 
I must accommodate myself, madame, in the latter case, to my circumstance. Much only is required where much is given. It becomes me to be thankful for what I have had. I have reason to bless you, madame, and my good Mrs. Norton, for bringing me up to be satisfied with little. With much less, I will venture to say, than my father's indulgence annually confers upon me. And then I thought of the old Roman and his lentils. "'What perverseness!' said my mother. "'But if you depend upon the favour of either or both of your uncles, vain will be that dependence. They will give you up, I do assure you, if your father does, and absolutely renounce you.' "'I am sorry, madame, that I have had so little merit as to have made no deeper impressions of favour for me in their hearts.' but I will love and honour them as long as I live. All this, Clarissa, makes your prepossession in a certain man's favour the more evident. Indeed your brother and sister cannot go anywhere, but they hear of these prepossessions. It is a great grief to me, madame, to be made the subject of the public talk, but I hope you'll have the goodness to excuse me for observing that the authors of my disgrace within doors the talkers of my prepossession without, and the reporters of it from abroad, are originally the same persons. She severely chid me for this. I received her rebukes in silence. You are sullen, Clarissa. I see you are sullen. And she walked about the room in anger. Then turning to me, You can bear the imputation of sullenness, I see. You have no concern to clear yourself of it. I was afraid of telling you all I was enjoyed to tell you, in case you were to be unpersuadable. But I find that I had greater opinion of your delicacy, of your gentleness, than I needed to have. It cannot discompose so steadily, so inflexible a young creature, to be told, as I now tell you, that the settlements are actually drawn and that you will be called down in a very few days to hear them read, and to sign them. For it is impossible, if your heart be free, that you can make the least objection to them, except it will be an objection with you, that they are so much in your favour, and in the favour of all our family. I was speechless, absolutely speechless. Although my heart was ready to burst, yet could I neither weep nor speak. I am sorry, said she, for your averseness to this match. Match, she was pleased to call it. But there is no help. The honour and interest of the family, as your aunt has told you, and as I have told you, are concerned, and you must comply. I was still speechless. She folded the warm statue, as she was pleased to call me, in her arms, and entreated me, for heaven's sake, to comply. Speech and tears were lent me at this time. You have given me life, madame, said I, clasping my uplifted hands together, and falling on one knee. A happy one, till now, has your goodness and my papa's made it. Oh, do not, do not make all the remainder of it miserable. Your father, replied she, is resolved not to see you, till he sees you as obedient a child as you used to be. You have never been put to a test till now, that deserved to be called a test. This is, this must be, my last effort with you. Give me hope, my dear child, my peace is concerned. I will compound with you but for hope, and yet your father will not be satisfied without an implicit and even a cheerful obedience. Give me but hope, child. To give you hope, my dearest, my most indulgent mamma, is to give you everything. Can I be honest, if I give a hope that I cannot confirm? She was very angry. She again called me perverse. She upbraided me with regarding only my prepossessions, and respecting not either her peace of mind or my own duty. It is a grating thing, said she, for the parents of a child who delighted in her in all the time of her helpless infancy, and throughout every stage of her childhood, 
and in every part of her education to womanhood, because of the promises she gave of proving the most grateful and dutiful of children, to find, just when the time arrived which should crown their wishes, that child stand in the way of her own happiness and her parents' comfort, and refusing an excellent offer and noble settlements, give suspicions to her anxious friends that she would become the property of a vile rake and libertine who, be the occasion what it will, defies her family, and has actually imbrued his hands in her brother's blood. "'I have had a very hard time of it,' said she, "'between your father and you. "'For seeing your dislike, I have more than once pleaded with you, "'but to all to no purpose. "'I am only treated as a too fond mother who, "'from motives of a blamable indulgence, "'encourage a child to stand in opposition to a father's will. "'I am charged with dividing the family into two parts, "'I and my youngest daughter standing against my husband, his two brothers, my son, my eldest daughter, and my sister Harvey. I have been told that I must be convinced of the fitness as well as advantage to the whole, your brother and Mr. Lovelace, out of the question, of carrying the contract with Mr. Soames, on which so many contracts depend, into execution. Your father's heart, I tell you once more, is in it. He has declared that he had rather have no daughter in you than one he cannot dispose of for your own good, especially if you have owned that your heart is free, and as the general good of his whole family is to be promoted by your obedience. He has pleaded, poor man, that his frequent gouty paroxysms, every fit more threatening than the former, give him no extraordinary prospects, either of worldly happiness or of long days and he hopes that you, who have been supposed to have contributed to the lengthening of your grandfather's life, will not, by your own disobedience, shorten your father's. This was a most affecting plea, my dear. I wept in silence upon it. I could not speak to it. And my mother proceeded, What, therefore, can be his motives, Clary Harlow, in the earnest desire he has to see his treaty perfected, but the welfare and aggrandizement of his family, which already having fortunes to become the highest condition, cannot but aspire to greater distinctions. However slight such views as these may appear to you, Clary, you know that they are not slight ones to any other f of the family and your father will be his own judge of what is and what is not likely to promote the good of his children. Your abstractness, my child, affection of abstractness, some call it, savours, let me tell you, of greater particularity than we aim to carry. Modesty and humility, therefore, will oblige you rather to mistrust yourself of peculiarity than censure views which all the world pursues as opportunity offers. I was still silent, and she proceeded, It is owing to the good opinion, Clary, which your father has of you, and of your prudence, duty, and gratitude, that he engaged from your compliance in your absence, before you returned from Miss Howe, and that he built and finished contracts upon it which cannot be made void or cancelled. But why, then, thought I, did they receive me, on my return from Miss Howe, with so much intimidating solemnity? To be sure, my dear, this argument, as well as the rest, was obtruded upon by my mother. She went on. Your father has declared that your unexpected opposition, unexpected, she was pleased to call it, and Mr. Lovelace's continued menaces and insults, more and more convince him that a short day is necessary in order to put an end to all that man's hopes, and to his own apprehensions resulting from the disobedience of a child so favoured. He has therefore actually ordered patterns of the richest silks to be sent for from London. I started. I was out of breath. I gasped at this frightful precipitance. I was going to open with warmth against it. I knew whose the happy expedient must be. Female minds 
I once heard my brother say, that could but be brought to balance on the charge of their state, might easily be determined by the glare and splendour of the nuptial preparations, and the pride of becoming the mistress of a family. But she was pleased to hurry on, that I might not have time to express my disgusts at such a communication. To this effect, your father, therefore, my Clary, cannot, either for your sake or his own, labour under a suspense so affecting to his repose. He has even thought fit to acquaint me, on my pleading for you, that it becomes me, as I value my own peace, how harsh to such a wife, and as I wish, that he does not suspect that I secretly favour the address of a vile rake, a character which all the sex, he is pleased to say, virtuous and vicious, are but too fond of, to exert my authority over you, and that this I may the less scrupulously do, as you have owned, the little string, that your heart is free. Unworthy reflection in my mother's case, surely, this of our sex's valuing a libertine, since she made choice of my father in preference to several suitors of equal fortune, because they were of inferior reputation for morals. Your father, added she, at his going out, told me what he expected from me, in case I found out that I had not the requisite influence upon you. It was this, that I should directly separate myself from you, and leave you singly to take the consequence of your double disobedience. I therefore entreat you, my dear Clarissa, concluded she, and that in the most earnest and condescending manner, to signify to your father, on his return, your ready obedience and this as well for my sake as your own. Affected by my mother's goodness to me, and by that part of her argument which related to her own peace, and to the suspicions they had of her secretly inclining to prefer the man so hated by them, to the man so much my aversion, I could not but wish it were possible for me to obey. I therefore paused, hesitated, considered, and was silent for some time. I could see that my mother hoped that the result of this hesitation would be favourable to her arguments. But then recollecting that all was owing to the instigations of a brother and a sister, wholly actuated by selfish and envious views, that I had not deserved the treatment I had of late met with, that my disgrace was already becoming the public talk that the man was Mr. Soames, and that my aversion to him was too generally known to make my compliance either creditable to myself or to them, that it would give my brother and sister a triumph over me, and over Mr. Lovelace, which they would not fail to glory in, and which, although it concerned me but little to regard on his account, yet might be attended with fatal mischiefs, and then Mr. Soames's disagreeable person, his still more disagreeable manners, his low understanding, understanding the glory of a man so little to be dispensed with in the head and director of a family, in order to preserve to him that respect which a good wife, and that for the justification of her own choice, should pay him herself, and wish everybody to pay him. And as Mr. Soames's inferiority in this respectable faculty of the human mind, I must be allowed to say this to you, and no great self-assumption neither, would proclaim to all future, as well as to all present observers, what must have been my mean inducement. All these reflections crowding upon my remembrance, I would, madame, said I, folding my hands, with an earnestness in which my whole heart was engaged, bear the cruelest tortures, bear loss of limb, and even of life to give you peace. But this man, every moment I would, at you command, think of him with favour, is the more aversion. You cannot, indeed you cannot, think how my whole soul resists him. And to talk of contracts concluded upon, of patterns of a short day, save me, save me, O oh my dearest mamma, save your child from this heavy, from this unsupportable evil. 
never was there a countenance that expressed so significantly as my mother's did an anguish which she struggled to hide under an anger she was compelled to assume till the latter overcoming the former she turned from me with an uplifted eye and stamping strange perverseness were the only words i heard of a sentence that she angrily pronounced and was going i then half frantically i believe laid hold of her gown have patience with me dearest madame said i do not renounce me totally if you must separate yourself from your child let it not be with absolute reprobation on your own part my uncles may be hard-hearted my father may be immovable i may suffer from my brother's ambition and from my sister's envy but let me not lose my mamma's love at least her pity she turned to me with benign rays you have my love you have my pity but oh my dearest girl i have not yours indeed indeed madame you have and all my reverence all my gratitude you have but in this one point cannot i be this once obliged will no expedient be accepted have i not made a very fair proposal to mr lovelace i wish for both our sakes my dear unpersuadable girl that the decision of this point lay with me but why when you know it does not why should you thus perplex and urge me to renounce mr lovelace is now but half what is aimed at nor will anybody else believe you in earnest in the offer if i would while you remain single mr lovelace will have hopes and you in the opinion of others inclinations permit me dearest madame to say that your goodness to me your patience your peace weigh more with me than all the rest put together for although i am to be treated by my brother and through his instigations by my father as a slave in this point and not as a daughter yet my mind is not that of a slave you have not brought me up to be mean so clary you are already at defiance with your father i have had too much cause before to apprehend as much what will this come to i and then my dear mamma sighed i am forced to put up with many humours that you are my ever honoured mamma is my grief and can it be thought that this very consideration and the apprehension of what may result from a much worse tempered man a man who has not half the sense of my father has not made an impression upon me to the disadvantage of the married life yet it is something of an alleviation if one must bear undue control to bear it from a man of sense my father i have heard you say madame was for years a very good human gentleman unobjectionable in person and manners but the man proposed to me forbear reflecting upon your father deny my dear in what i have repeated and i think they are the very words reflect upon my father it is not possible i must say again and again were all men equally indifferent to you that you should be thus sturdy in your will i am tired out with your obstinacy the most unpersuadable girl you forget that i must separate myself from you if you will not comply you do not remember that your father will take you up where i leave you once more however i will put it to you are you determined to brave your father's displeasure are you determined to defy your uncles do you choose to break with us all rather than encourage mr solmes rather than give me hope dreadful alternative but is not my sincerity is not the integrity of my heart concerned in the answer may not my everlasting happiness be the sacrifice will not the least shadow of the hope you just now demanded from me be driven into absolute and sudden certainty is it not sought to ensnare to entangle me in my own desire of obeying if i could give answers that might be construed into hope 
Forgive me, madame. Bear with your child's boldness in such a cause as this. Settlements drawn, patterns sent for, an early day. Dear, dear madame, how can I give hope, and not intend to be this man's? Ah, girl, never say your heart is free. You deceive yourself if you think it is. Thus to be driven, and I wrung my hands through impatience, by the instigations of a designing and ambitious brother, and by a sister that— How often, Clary, must I forbid you unsisterly reflections? Does not your father, do not your uncles, does not everybody patronise Mr. Soames? And let me tell you, ungrateful girl, and unmovable as ungrateful, let me repeatedly tell you that it is evident to me that nothing but a love unworthy of your prudence can make you a creature late so dutiful, now so sturdy. You may guess what your father's first question on his return will be. He must know that I can do nothing with you. I have done my part. Seek me if your mind change before he comes back. You have yet a little more time, as he stays supper. I will no more seek you, nor to you. And away she flung. What could I do but weep? I am extremely affected on my mother's account. More, I must needs say, than on my own. And indeed, all things considered, and especially that the measure she is engaged in, is as I dare say it is, against her own judgment. She deserves more compassion than myself. Excellent woman! What pity that meekness and condensation should not be attended with the due rewards of those charming graces! Yet had she not let violent spirits, as I have elsewhere observed with no small regret, find their power over hers, it could not have been thus. But here, run away with my pen. I suffer my mother to be angry with me on her own account. She hinted to me, indeed, that I must seek her, if my mind changed, which is a condition that amounts to a prohibition of attending her. But, as she left me in displeasure, will it not have a very obstinate appearance, and look like a kind of renunciation of her mediation and my favour, if I go not down before my father returns to supplicate her pity? and her kind report to him. I will attend her. I had rather all the world should be angry with me than my mamma. Meantime, to clear my hands from papers of such a nature, Hannah shall deposit this. If two or three letters reach you together, they will but express from one period to another the anxieties and difficulties which the mind of your unhappy but ever affectionate friend labours under. Clarissa Harlow End of Letter 20